Welcome to Moments with Marianne. Allow me to interrupt your train of thought with something that may be one of the most interesting things you hear today. This is Marianne Pastana, and we're here today with special guest, Dr. Matthew Welsh, who's the founder of Spiritual Media Blog. So let's welcome to the show, Dr. Matthew Welch. Oh, thank you so much for having me, Marianne. It's uh, going to be a lot of fun talking with you tonight. Oh, my goodness. I'm looking forward to this. Seems like we've known each other forever. The work that you do has always been there and always been such a great inspiration to me. What inspired you to get Spiritual Media Blog together? Well, that's a really good question. It really started about 12 years ago. I had moved out to Los Angeles um, from Indianapolis right after I graduated law school. And I started working for an entertainment agency called the William Morris Agency, which is now William Morris Endeavor. And at the time, I was very interested in spiritual and inspirational movies, uh, movies like What the Bleep, uh, some of the older movies like, you know, It's a Wonderful Life or What Dreams May Come. And I was really excited about these movies, but not a whole lot of other people in Hollywood were. I was working kind of in the heart of Hollywood and the entertainment um, industry, and people just didn't really know about these movies. Um, So I originally created Spiritual Media Blog to raise awareness for these movies that were being made uh, to let people know that they were out there. And since then it's expanded um, to books um, to also to people who write about psychology, uh, spirituality, or just have websites, TV shows, music, just related to consciousness or holistic spirituality or just psychological development. Uh, So that's, that's how it started. Well, I find your blog to be so inspiring and so impressive. How do you determine like who you want to have on the blog? Does it just have to resonate with you? Yeah, I mean, it really does have to resonate with me. I mean, I will probably get, I mean, some days I'll get like 10 emails a day and these are from, you know, authors or publicists or filmmakers from all over the world. And so I'm trying to read through their emails um, to really see, you know, yeah, it does the book or the movie resonate with me. And then it's also really want to make sure does the book or movie have a message that's going to help others or have some sort of inspirational or uplifting effect. Um, I would say about 95% of the, the authors or filmmakers are people who contact me. They're people who email me. Um, and occasionally I will reach out to other authors or filmmakers if it's somebody that I'm really interested in um, or I've just been a big fan with. But most of the time it's, um, it's authors or their publicists. Um, I mean, you have referred me to a lot of wonderful authors and that's always great if I get a publicist who I know and trust um because that that helps me know like okay this this is legitimate this is this is going to be a good book and a good message oh my goodness well thank you you know it seems like we both are on this kind of path to bring i think just positivity to the world and how we can help each other in many ways you know yeah absolutely i mean that was really at the heart and core of spiritual media blog is you know there's there is, I don't want to dwell on it, but there is a lot of darkness and negativity in the world, in the news, in the entertainment industry. So I just wanted to, you know, shine a light and and give a platform to these authors and these filmmakers who are creating these books and these movies that really show what humanity is, the good that humanity is capable of doing, or the challenges that people who have overcome, or just an inspirational message or story that they've gone through. Well, and it so seems that, you know, when someone's going through a challenge, it's not, even though we feel like it's just our unique challenge at the time, many of us are going through the same challenge at the same time. You're right. And I think that's one thing that I really, it's, it's been really inspiring and really touching just how much, um, authors and other people are willing to share their stories, overcoming pretty serious tragedies, whether it's a, a, a death of a loved one, um, 
or a divorce or a cancer diagnosis. Um, and, and so people are willing to, to write about those events and share the tools that they use to help them overcome them. And you're right. I think that does a couple of things that helps people who might be reading it, who have gone through similar situations, feel less alone. And then it hopefully can also give them a little wisdom and insight in how to, to develop some tools to, to navigate some very challenging situations in their life. So I know that you left your job as a lawyer. What made you decide to leave your job, leave LA and go for a career change? Yeah. So that, that is kind of a long story. Um, cause it didn't, it did not happen overnight. Um, so yeah, I started off in Los Angeles in the entertainment industry. I was not happy there. Um, I just sort of felt out of place. I was more interested in spirituality and psychology, um, and really wanted to make more of a direct impact in people's lives. So I probably went to the exact opposite type of law. I moved back to Indianapolis and started working for the Department of Child Services as a trial lawyer, helping abused and neglected children find a safe place to live. And I really admired um, that mission and what they were trying to accomplish. But a lot of the my day was just spent arguing. It was spent arguing with other lawyers, arguing with judges, arguing with with, with clients and, and, and social workers. I mean, everybody, I think, was trying to do the right thing, but the nature of the legal system is it's an adversarial system. And so it just kind of wore on me. I mean, if I found a client that or a cause that I believed in, I really did like fighting for that cause. But if it was a client or someone that I didn't believe in, I didn't really like doing that. Um, so I left that. I tried to go into private practice, work for a, a family law firm. And it was a similar situation, spent most of my days arguing. But what I actually found was the parts of my day that I brought me the most joy and meaning was when I would have a, a client tell me about the situation they were going through. And I was just, and I would just listen to them. So maybe it might be a parent going through a divorce or a mother or father who had lost custody of their child. And they would come to me in tears telling me how much they loved their child and wanted to try to spend more time with them. And, you know, as my, as a lawyer, my job was to try to, you know, help them get custody, but I would just sit there sometimes and, and listen to them. And they would just tell me, you know, thank you for listening. Um, you know, that's not really what I was getting paid for, but that's really what I love to do. And so I thought, you know, this, if I could spend more time working with people on a more personal level, helping them to deal with these, these problems so that they don't need a lawyer, then that would be really, really wonderful. That got me interested in psychology, mental health, um, at the time, I was actually really struggling because I didn't know what sort of career I wanted to go into. So I pursued my own therapy and just got really interested in that. And then at the age of, I think it was uh, 29, I left a law firm and uh, got a master's and then PhD in counseling psychology. And, and now I work as a full-time psychologist. So I know that's a long story, but uh, that it happened over a span of about uh, seven or eight years. <laughs> well, it's interesting where we start off and where our paths take us. Yeah. And I just found um, that it was so courageous of you to follow your path and find it because a lot of times people will continue doing a job where they feel unfulfilled or they're feeling like it's too much because I can understand why a job like that, you know, being an attorney would be overwhelming at times. It, it, it really was for me. I mean, it was not a good fit for my personality. It helped me develop a lot of good critical thinking skills, which I still use. And I'm glad that I have, but yeah, I just, I was not happy. I was not fulfilled. I tried it for about three or four years in different capacities. Um, and just, it just drained me. Um, and it was also, and then part of the challenge of that too was, I was feeling like, you know, I should be happy. Like I'm a lawyer, like, why aren't I happy? It was, you know, it's a, supposed to be a, a well-known job. And then on top of that, there was times when I didn't know what to do. So I just felt kind of lost. 
and like I was starting over and didn't know where to go. So eventually I sort of, I found my way towards to psychology and mental health, but it, it, it took a while and, and I felt really good once I found it. I can imagine. Well, and it has me thinking, you know, with the spiritual media blog, I mean, how was the evolution of that as you're going through these times? That is a is a great question. And that spiritual media blog, it really almost at times was like my own uh, like personal like journal or even like it wasn't formal therapy, but sometimes it felt like it because, you know, if I was going through, if I was struggling through trying to find more meaning and purpose in my life and feeling stuck, I would reach out to, to authors who were feeling stuck or who were going through similar situations. There's a uh, one author named Jeff Brown, um, another author I recently interviewed, Karen Johnson, who are both attorneys and very unhappy with their work as attorneys, eventually left to become an author, coach, um, consultants. Um, and so when I would, I would, when I would read their books, it would help me feel a little less alone. And it would also, you know, make me realize, okay, if there's other people going through these situations, you know, I, I'm not alone. I can, if they can get through it, you know, here's some tools that I can use. So it, it really gave me like my own source of, of inspiration and meaning and purpose throughout this. And, I mean, I've been doing this for 12 years and it's, it's really been, been kind of like a, a helpful tool for my, for my own self. So, you know, hopefully other people find similar meaning and guidance in it as well. I'm sure they do. I mean, I'm sure you're not the only person like how Karen and the other person you mentioned are just, um, you know, they get to a point where it's like, okay, this no longer serves my soul. I need to make a change. Yeah. Yeah. And that's what it really was. It was really like on a deep soul level. And, you know, it, it, it was a period of time where I really just felt stuck and like I was starting over and I really did feel like I was like doing some soul searching. And I started, you know, asking myself, you know, what really is going to give me meaning and purpose in life? how can I really be of service to other people? What are things that I do that really give me joy? And, you know, a lot of it was coming from my blog, like finding out like um, about psychology, personal growth, spiritual development, interviewing these authors who were going through challenges in their life and overcoming those challenges. Um, so then I realized like, you know, I would like to help other people in their life overcome their challenges as well. Um, so I actually started giving um, talks to high schools, colleges, nonprofits, um, and on how to find a meaningful career path. And that made me realize, realize like, yeah, you know, this is something that is really, I'm, I'm really makes me happy. Like I really like helping other people deal with their problems in their lives and overcoming challenges. And it's, it's very, very, it's much more in alignment with my, with my soul. Well, I think that can be very inspiring for young people to hear that, you know, because often they, I think there's a lot of pressure to find out, okay, like, what am I going to do? And they think it's for like the rest of their lives when they choose a career. And it may be something like with me, I thought, oh, I'll get into nursing. Well, blood makes me pass out. So it's a poor career choice. (laughs) (laughs) Right. Right. But, you know, so you got to pivot. You got to look at this and go, okay, well, not that. But it's almost like when you have these discussions, you're giving people permission to look elsewhere and to find fulfillment. Absolutely. And those are a couple of really good points. In my opinion, I feel like our society and our culture puts so much pressure on us to, to have it, it all figured out and to meet these certain benchmarks at certain ages in our life. It's like, you know, by this age, you're supposed to have a job, you're supposed to have a family, you're supposed to have a house, you know, the car and the vacation. And then if for some reason you don't meet those benchmarks at that age, then it, it, you really start to feel, you start to question yourself or feel like a failure. I mean, I know for me, I, I, was, I was 29 years old and I was unhappy as a lawyer. There was a time, uh, an extended period of time where I was out of work and I didn't know what to do. And I, I felt that pressure, like, you know, what's wrong with me? I'm 29 years old. 
I, I have a law degree. I should be happy. I should be successful. My, my friends are starting families, having houses. And here I, I feel like I'm starting over. But it, it did, like you said, it gave me a, an opportunity to really look at myself and my life differently and find out what it is that I really wanted. And another thing that it actually did is I had been so focused on achieving these external benchmarks that when those external benchmarks were not achieved, even though it felt in some sense like a failure, it made me stop and pause and say like, okay, instead of focusing on what I'm doing, why don't I take some time to focus on who I am being and what I am on the inside. And so then I started looking at, you know, what are some of the qualities and characteristics inside of me that are important to me and give me meaning and purpose. And I actually would write those down on a daily basis. And the three like values or characteristics that started coming up for me was like, I, I, I didn't know at the time, I didn't know what I wanted to do, but I, I wanted to be authentic and I wanted to be inspiring. So I looked for ways to be authentic and I looked for ways to inspire other people and, and to be a, do that of being by being of service. And fortunately now, one of my greatest joys in life is inspiring other people to be their most authentic selves. And I feel like I get a chance to do that with my blog and work as a psychologist. With your psychology work, do you work with families, individuals, children, all the above? It's it's primarily individuals. There's some couples work. So I work full time as a clinical psychologist in the outpatient mental health clinic of a veterans affairs hospital. Um, so I'm working um, with veterans who many of the common issues they face would be like trauma, PTSD, depression, anxiety, substance use, some relationships, some career and work issues. I also have my own private practice um, and my own private coaching practice um, where I, I work with similar issues. Um, it's, so it's, it's primarily individuals from, you know, the age range typically is, anywhere from like 18 to 80. Um, I, there's some couples that work that I do, but yeah, primarily individuals. Okay. There's so much there I want to unpack. <laughs> <laughs> sure. well, why, why don't we start with this? So with the, with the coaching that you do, is there like a, a theme or kind of a, a, like a usual reason or reasons that people search you out? It's a, the, a lot of the coaching that I do, it tends to be people who are feeling unhappy or unfulfilled in their career. Um, a lot of times it's people who have achieved some success in their career, but they're not happy or they want to switch their job. Um, so it's really helping people find um, a meaningful career path for them or find some sort of fulfilling work to do. That tends to be the, the majority of the, the coaching work that I do. And sometimes that those same people, they're dealing with some, some depression and some anxiety. Um, so, you know, we can work on that, but it's primarily finding like uh, meaningful work or more fulfillment and purpose in their life. Usually that's kind of like helping them to map that out because I mean, we're not given the map as we grow up, you know, it's something like, Hey, you're supposed to expect to know how to do all this, you know? Right. Exactly. So oftentimes one of the first conversations that I have with them is like, you know, it's okay if you don't know exactly what your purpose is, or it's okay if you don't know exactly what sort of work or job you want to do. Let's just start with the basics here. You know, what are some subjects that you're curious about learning more about? Um, what are some of your interests? Are there any things that like you would skip lunch to do just because it makes you excited about doing? Are there any hobbies that you want to develop or books that you want to read? Um, and on a deeper level, it's sometimes I'll even ask them, you know, what do you feel any, um, like callings in your intuition or your instincts or your guts on a deeper level where you feel prodded to make some decision, even if it might not seem practical. 
Do you often find that people maybe are afraid to make a choice of a change in career or lifestyle or what have you, because maybe they're afraid of the income um, impacts it would have? Yes, I think that this is a this is a, a a very huge challenge, and this is a legitimate one. So oftentimes, when people are making career changes, it's not as simple as just you know I'm not happy doing this, so I want to do so I'm going to quit my job and then I'm going to go do that. Some people are fortunate enough to be able to do that, but other people it it can take a little more creativity or it can take a little more time. I mean, I, I seem to work with a lot of writers who are interested in um, pursuing writing full-time. And so, I mean, as, as you probably know, working with writers, sometimes you can't just quit your job and become a full-time writer. It's like, okay, how can we carve out time in your already extremely busy schedule to pursue something that you really do like? So that might mean it's like, you know, are you willing to spend, you know, an hour or two on a Saturday or Sunday doing something that you really like doing? Can you take, um, is there is there any volunteer organizations that you can volunteer your time for? Um and, you know, can you, can you give yourself an hour a day or 15 minutes a day um, to pursue something that you're interested in? And what that does is, you know, that can help you to not only develop your interests, but you're also developing your skill set over time. So then when the time is right, you know, you, 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 it does become easier to develop that income. Yeah, I would think that, well, let's put it this way. I, I know in working with authors, when you write a book and it gets published, no one ima- you know hands you an imaginary check for a million dollars. It doesn't work that way. <laughs> right, know? exactly. You still have to work your day job. You yes, know? exactly, exactly. <laughs> And and that can be challenging. And then it's like, if that day job is not something that's providing you fulfillment, you know, ask yourself, what is this providing me? And maybe it's helping you to develop a skill set that's going to help you in the future. Or maybe it's helping you develop a personality trait in the future. I mean, at the time, even though I knew I wasn't happy being a lawyer, there was part of me deep down that knew like, okay, this is helping me become more disciplined. This is helping me to deal with conflict. This is helping me to deal with um, very difficult personalities. And all of those skills I use every day as a psychologist and a coach. Uh, It's not quite the same environment, but I feel much more comfortable handling difficult situations um, and being able to use some analytical skills because of what I developed as a lawyer. Do you find that if people um, really kind of focus more on the positive that their work environments are presenting, and I've, I've got to tell you that one with uh, learning how to deal with difficult people, I think everyone's got that on their little checklist, you know, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know? Yeah. but is it just like focusing more on the positive while you're, you're doing that? Cause I mean, we all have to work jobs sometimes that we might not really appreciate or like, but maybe there's a way that we can reframe it. Yeah, I think there's a couple of things you can do. Um, One, you can ask yourself, you know, how is this job helping other people from a big picture perspective? I I, I mean, I remember I went to one um, program for lawyers and I will say that the presenter made a good point. He said, you know, a lot of lawyers, they get frustrated with all the paperwork they're filing um, because they feel like all they're doing is paperwork and research, but they lose sight that, you know, maybe that paperwork is going to really help someone in the future. So it's like, if you can take a look at your job and say, you know, what sort of positive impact is my job having on someone else? So you kind of get yourself out of the equation and, 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 realize, you know, my job matters. The work that I do is making a difference in another person's life. Even if I'm not seeing that directly, that's hard to do. But if you can do that, it's helpful. The the second thing, like you said, is, yeah, if you can focus on certain aspects of your job that you do enjoy, I mean, and carve out time for that, that can make a difference. And then the third thing is sometimes you can get creative with your job if you just don't like it. And, 
you know, you don't feel like you're helping other people. It's like, you know, does that job allow you any time during the day to do things you do like to do? You know, can you, can you, is it possible to take a, you know, an extra 15 minute break and, and write one page for your novel? Or can you just take a 15 minute break and meditate for 15 minutes during that time and contemplate what you'd like to do sometime? So, you know, those are some of the things that I think can, can help. All great advice, all great expert advice. <laughs> so, yeah. 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 Well, especially because you have been there, done that, you know? So it's, you're blazing a trail for others who are looking to make that type of transition. Abs- yeah, absolutely. And on a deeper level, I mean, I remember just like a- at the time when I was unhappy, I remember just asking, you know, whether you call it the universe or God or higher power, I said, help me develop the skills and strengths that I need to fulfill my deeper purpose. Like I, I, and I didn't know what my deeper purpose was. And at the time I didn't know what those skills and strengths were that I needed to develop, but I just, I, I kind of trusted that, you know, even though this wasn't where I was going to be for the rest of my life, there was something about it where I was like, okay, I'm supposed to be here right now. And it's helping me to develop some strength or skill that I can use in the future. And, you know, that, even though I didn't like what I was doing at the time, I sort of trusted like, you know, this is, this is helping me. This is, this is giving me a thicker skin, or maybe this is helping me to understand what pain is so that I can help other people manage their pain in the future. Wow. I, you know, and that's such a great way to look at that. What a great perspective. And it has me kind of thinking too, I mean, my goodness, you're doing all this great work with veterans and thank you for doing that. I think they need more support than we give them. When, when you're working with someone who has trauma or PTSD, what is it like working with them? It's, um, it's very, it's very challenging. It's very intense, but it can also be very rewarding. So you're typically talking to somebody who is sharing with you the most painful experience that they have ever gone through in their life. And, you know, that's also a very, I feel very humbled and very privileged to do that. I feel like that's a a sacred responsibility. So I take that very seriously. Um, So the, the, first and foremost is I want to make sure that they feel heard, that they feel a sense of empathy, that they're not being judged. Um, Because oftentimes people who have gone through trauma, they feel um, alone. They feel like they're, they're still, unfortunately, is a bit of a stigma or taboo related to therapy or even experiencing trauma. Um, So I try to help them feel like you know, you're not alone. Um, what you're experiencing is a understandable reaction to a very extremely set of um, difficult and traumatic circumstances. Um, and then from there, I, I try to help them um, become comfortable and, and motivated to engage in therapy. Do you find that your jobs maybe has gotten a little bit easier over the last couple of years because there's such an emphasis on mental health now? Um, I would say that there has been a reduction in the stigma and taboo related to therapy, trauma, and grief. Um, I mean, I, I do appreciate people. I mean, in the news, people talk about trauma and grief much more often in the last couple of years than they ever have before. So if people are experiencing PTSD um, or if they've gone through something traumatic, I think, yeah, they don't feel quite as alone. So they are more willing to seek out therapy. And um, I mean, yeah, I personally have just seen in the last year, a lot more people coming to therapy um, and they, they, they feel a little more under, understanding about that. In your experience, when you're working with people that have trauma or PTSD, do you find that they also experience anxiety and anger? Yeah. So anxiety and anger are two of the most common symptoms of PTSD. So typically when people have gone through something um, traumatic, what that does is that 
makes their fight or flight response over active. So they've experienced something where they have felt in danger, unsafe, or like their life has been threatened, or they've seen somebody else's life has been threatened. What that does is that makes them feel like they have a heightened need to want to protect themselves. So when the average person might be walking down a street, they can feel at ease or comfortable, but somebody who's gone through trauma they are more likely to overestimate the likelihood that there's going to be a threat. So their anxiety level is naturally heightened. They also, and they also may feel due to being on edge, they're going to be much more irritable or much more quickly to become angry. Does that seem to be like a natural response because they're trying to protect themselves? Yeah. So that's what I try to work with them and tell them and say, Especially so a lot of the, a lot of the the veterans that I work with are veterans who have experienced military combat related PTSD. So they may have been deployed overseas. So they're in a, in a situation where they're, they have to be on guard in order to protect themselves and survive. They um, may have seen um, one of their other soldiers or one of their buddies die in combat, or they themselves have escaped, um, combat, just trying to survive. So at, at, at that time, they needed to be on guard in order to protect themselves and survive. But then when they transition from military to civilian, it's a difficult transition for them because th they're so used to being on guard and have this need to protect themselves, but they no longer need to do that. So part of one of the interventions that I will do with them when they're, they're, anxiety is, is raised is I will literally ask them, okay, when you, when you feel this heightened anxiety, ask yourself, is there a threat? And if the answer to that question is no, tell yourself, no, there is no threat. I am safe. Because if they don't ask themselves that, like their, their body and their mind is automatically going to think that there is a threat. But if they can ask themselves that, it can, it can slow down that fight or flight response and remind themselves that they're safe. So anyone can use that let's say we're driving down the freeway and we're feeling anxious and angry because that happens all the time. <laughs> you know, we're people who have a lot of windshield time. So if, is that a, a tool that we can use then? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, there's a, a lot of tools that you can use, but if you are feeling, I mean, anxiety and anger can be treated a little bit both differently, but if you are feeling anxious, the first thing that I would recommend you to do is just accept that you're feeling anxious, just identify it and say, I'm, I'm anxious right now. Just by identifying that, that alone can reduce some of the anxiety. The second thing would then be to, to ask yourself, yes, is there a threat here? And if the answer to that question is no, tell yourself, no, there is no threat. I am safe. Or if you're not certain, you can say there is likely no threat here. I am probably safe. And again, when you do that, that can deactivate some of that fight or flight response. I mean, this is something that you don't necessarily need to know, but when the fight or flight response is activated, it's activating your amygdala or the emotional part of your brain or the sympathetic nervous system. And what you want to do is, is deactivate that emotional response or lower that anxiety. And you can do that by activating your frontal lobes, which is in charge of rational thinking or logical thinking. So one of the ways to do that is to ask a very logical question. So if you ask yourself, is there a threat? And the answer is no. Not only are you like reminding yourself that you're safe, you're actually activating your frontal lobes, which deactivate the amygdala, which can lower that anxiety response. Does that, does that make sense? It, it makes perfect sense. And it, well, and it has me thinking, so we get through that. Let's say there are a few folks that are still breathing in a paper bag. I mean, yeah. what would they do next? So then, yeah, I mean, the breathing is a good point. So when that fight or flight response is activated, your sympathetic nervous system has is, is been activated and you need to, to deactivate that. One of the way you, there's, there's two, I think, techniques that can be helpful. Essentially, you want to engage in some relaxation exercise. The one that I recommend, because I think it's the simplest to use and you can use anywhere is called 444 four, 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 four breathing. And what that does is you breathe in your nose, you, you breathe in for a count of four, 
you hold for a count of four, and then you exhale for a count of four. And you can do that anywhere. And you can do that with your eyes open or your eyes closed. And that's a count of four. So that's just like breathe in one, two, three, four, hold one, two, three, four, exhale one, two, three, four. And what that does is that'll slow your breathing down which should hopefully activate the parasympathetic nervous system, which then lowers that anxiety. So that's a breathing technique that I really recommend. And for people who have been through trauma, I I recommend you actually practice that breathing technique when you're not in a state of anxiety. Like you spend five or 10 minutes in the morning, five or 10 minutes at night going through that because you're, you're training in your mind and your body how to relax. Um, other things that can be helpful that take a little more practice, but they're more like body awareness exercises, or if anybody's familiar with yoga nidra, um, that can really help because you're training your body to relax. Um, but if you go onto YouTube and you search body scan awareness, it's simply helping you to become aware of the, of your body. And so in those moments, when you're anxious, your body tends to tense up. And if you can just become aware of where that tension is in your body and just make a slight effort to relax it, that can help to calm the anxiety also. So can people do this? Like, let's say if they're out walking or driving or you name it, or do they have to be home in a quiet place? The breathing exercise um, is definitely something you can do anywhere. Um, I mean, you can be, um, you can do that with your eyes open and you can breathe in for a count of four, hold for a count of four and exhale for a count of four. Um, that's something you can do anywhere. And that's a really good question because I've, i when I work with people with trauma and PTSD, I say, they'll tell me like, I can't do these breathing exercises when I'm at work. And, and they're, and they're, they're right because they've been, tra- they've been taught to do a breathing exercise where they'll, they'll look kind of funny if they're doing a breathing exercise in front of their boss. But if you just make an effort to just slow your breathing down, you really can pretty much do that anywhere. Um, the, the, the mindfulness body awareness exercises, sometimes those can be a little more challenging to do anywhere, but you, but you can do a modified versions of those. Meaning like if you're feeling tension in your shoulders, you can just lower your shoulders. Or if you're feeling like tension in your jaw, you can just say like, wow, I'm feeling tension in my jaw. Or sometimes just bringing your awareness to like your heart rate. Like sometimes if I'm getting anxious or angry, I start to feel my heart beating faster. And I'm like, okay, my, my heart's beating really fast right now. And just by be placing my awareness on that and just lowering my shoulders, loosening my jaw, that can, that can help to, to manage some of that anxiety. Is, is, that, is that helpful? Oh my gosh, it sure is. And I appreciate you taking the time to go through that. Yeah. It, it feels like all of us, and maybe maybe it's just me, I don't know, but I, I know a lot of my friends are kind of feeling the same way where we're constantly feeling like we're being chased by a pack of wolves, you know? So- <laughs> <laughs> yes. Yeah, exactly. I mean, we are living in a state um, uh, where a lot of us are in a state of anxiety and stress. And one additional point I should make with this is anxiety and any emotion, there's a range to it. So let's take anxiety since we've been talking about that at the highest level. Like if you were to rank anxiety on a scale of one to 10, let's say 10 is like a full-blown panic attack. And one is like the most relaxed you've ever been. If you're in a state of anxiety and you're doing these exercises, the goal really is not to eliminate the anxiety. It's just trying to bring it down like one notch, because if you can bring it down one notch, then first of all, you've decreased your anxiety, but you're, you've also shown yourself you have some control over it. And the more you practice it, the better you're going to get at it. So I, the only reason I say that is like, you know, if you're still feeling anxious, like don't beat yourself up because you're still feeling anxious. Like, uh, you know, unfortunately, it's just part of being human sometimes. Does that, does that make sense? Oh, yes, it sure does. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, well, and to you, it's interesting because in your blog, you really do this perfect. It's kind of like almost like you've woven together psychology and spirituality. Yeah. And I think a lot of times people may get a little confused about the difference between the two. And yeah, this is a great question. And, you know, this is something that I've kind of asked myself a lot. And I think, you know, from a big, big picture perspective, 
spirituality has more to do with your connection to some sort of higher power, whether that's the universe, some people might call it spirit, some people might call it God, but it's a, a feeling of connection to something greater than yourself. Whereas psychology has more to do with um, managing your emotions, changing your thinking, changing your behavior, how you interact and respond in the world. Sometimes those overlap, the spirituality and psychology, but sometimes they don't. Is, is that, is that helpful? Oh my gosh. That's very helpful. Very yeah. helpful. So thank you for getting into that because, you know, I think sometimes people kind of confuse spirituality with religion, you yeah. know, and then psychology they think is like the redheaded stepchild or something. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> you know so. Yes. Yes. So, I mean, yeah, those are, I mean, you know, we could, we could talk a lot about this, but yeah. So spirituality I see is different than religion because I see spirituality as more as your own personal experience of that higher power. Whereas religion is typically a set of like practices and beliefs. Um, and then psychology, you know, it can help you, um, better manage your emotions, your thoughts and your behavior so that you can, have a have a deeper spirituality. Um, so I, I think that they they can work hand in hand with each other, um, but but sometimes they don't always. Sometimes people are like, I'm I'm very very spiritual, but I'm not really into psychology. And some people are like, you know, I'm I'm very into psychoanal psychoanalysis, but I want nothing to do with spirituality. So sometimes there's an overlap. Sometimes there's not. Okay. Well, I'm going to put you on the hot seat now. Okay. <laughs> I'm sure you love that, right? Sure, sure. Yeah, hey, you, your attorney self will kind of, your attorney hat will kind of come on with your spirituality hat. Okay. So, so of all the people you've interviewed, and I'm not asking you to pick your favorite one because that would be really tough. But <laughs> <laughs> what's one that really stands out for you? Oh man, that's so hard because I really do like them all. Um, I mean, if I have to have maybe what I would say one or two, I mean, I would say either Stephen Simon or Vicki King. Um, I, I, I'm not sure. I'll, I'll start with Stephen Simon first. I'm, I'm not sure if people who have heard of him, but he, he was a huge inspiration to me and my blog um, about 15 years ago, or maybe 20 years ago, he started um, this spiritual DVD club called Spiritual Cinema Circle. And he, he created it. It was, it, was, it was an inspiration to my blog because he created this DVD club because he wanted to raise awareness for these spiritual movies. He himself, his background is absolutely fascinating. He, he started off as a main, mainstream Hollywood producer and, and probably his most famous movie he made was Bill and Ted's Excellent Adventure with Keanu Reeves. But then he started making some more spiritual movies like What Dreams May Come. Um, and then he even made a movie that wasn't mainstream, but pretty spiritual called Conversations with God based on Neil Donald Walsh's book and another movie called Indigo. So he, he made all these incredibly, you know, and for him to do that is just you know, it is pretty, pretty fascinating for him to do that and, and not easy to do in Hollywood. So I always really admired him and he was always an inspiration to me. Um, and about a couple, about a year or two ago, though, his um, wife had passed away and uh, unexpectedly. And he, um, about six to eight weeks after that, he said his wife uh, started communicating with him um, from the afterlife. And he said that they they wrote a book together. And I mean, this just really just touched me that, you know, um, his, his book was about how the, their love um, never, never died. And, and I was able to interview him about um, his book. And again, it was just very touching because you could just tell he had so much love for his wife. And then it was just also really fascinating, too, that he had written this um book with her um, when she was in the afterlife. Um, so that's not a very traditional um, book, but his story is fascinating. Um, so I really, really liked interviewing him. Um, and then I, I was also able to interview Vicki King. Um, 
And it was, you know, I'll just, for people who don't know who Vicki King is, she wrote this um, book called The Inner Movie Method that of all things was featured on the, the TV show Sopranos. Um, but what really, I really was really struck by her story because this was after the fires in Malibu and I was interviewing her um, because her house had burned down in Malibu and she, I was like, I remember asking her, like, you know, weren't you scared? Wasn't that really traumatic for you? And she just said with like such peace and such grace, she said, uh, no, I just saw that as, um, as a, it was an adventure for me. And it was just, a, I just knew it was time for me to move on to the next chapter of my life. And it was really inspired when she shared that with me. And it kind of made me look at my life different. Like, you know, if something unexpected happens to me, you know, I can just look at this as like an adventure. Um, and, 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 and Vicky, the whole, our interview was about, you know, learning how to thrive in the midst of challenging circumstances. And she had really lived that. So it was both Vicky King and Stephen Simon are probably two, two, two that stand out to me, but I, I could probably name like 10 more, but those two really stand out. <laughs> well, I can understand why they stand out, but I would agree with you. You know, when I go through and I read your blog and I, you know, go through the videos that you have, I mean, I, I really learn a lot and I always appreciate going through, you know, other people's information because I learn, you know, if we just stick yeah. with our stuff, it's like, where do we go with that? You know? Yeah, exactly. And I think that's probably honestly one of my favorite things about my my the doing the blog and the interviews is it's like I I ask them the questions that like that I want to know, like because I feel like if I want to know these questions, there's got to be other people out there that want to know them too. But yeah, it's just like, you know, when you hear other people going through challenges in their life, you know, I think it can inspire you to um handle the challenges that you're going through as well. Well, that's kind of what I'm doing here. <laughs> yeah. Well, I, I mean, I, I, it's very, it's very kind of you and nice of you to say that. No, I, I'm all, all joking aside. Yeah, I, I do appreciate your interview style because you do ask a lot of questions that people really, I mean, if you're asking the questions, a lot of other people have the questions that are formulated in one way or another, or perhaps, you know, it's answering a question they don't even know that they've got yet. Yeah. Yeah. That's a good, that's a good point. And um, yeah, I mean, and, and I, and I also, I try to, I try to ask it from a, from a, I try to intermix like the spiritual with the practical. Um, I mean, I think part of that is because it's like, I, I know what it's like to struggle in your work. I know what it's like not to have a job. I know what it's like to worry about money. So, you know, when people talk about, you know, some of these deep spiritual ideas, I, I try to bring it back more from a grounded perspective. And I, I think maybe some of that maybe is my background in law or psychology, just, you know, saying, you know, you know, what about people who are really struggling out there, people who aren't happy with their work? Like, you know, what is, what does self-realization mean to somebody who's um, not able to find a job? So I've got a very serious question to ask you here. Sure. So you turn 40, <laughs> you <have> my <laughs> old baby. Hey, how do you feel about being a new father? And congratulations, by the way. Oh, thank you so much. I, it has been the greatest joy um, in my life. And um, it's, yeah, I mean, I, I do feel like, you know, some, um, some, some of my struggles with my career made me wait maybe a little bit longer to have a baby, but yeah, I turned, uh, I, I, I had a, I had a baby son in, in June and then I turned 40 in November. This is uh, my wife and I's first baby. And it has been a, an incredible joy. Um, I, sometimes I don't get as much sleep as I'd like to, but it's, um, it's, it's been a lot of fun. I'm, I'm, I'm really enjoying it. And well, congratulations. I mean, that's such, and, and I just kind of think about your son's going to have such a head start in life, having you as a dad oh. with the experiences that you have. So congratulations. <laughs> oh, thank you. That's really nice of you to say that. I hope so. <laughs> Well, and so Matt, I mean, we could talk forever. I mean, it, we, that's not a problem I have with you when we talk about spirituality and all this good stuff. Where can our listeners connect with you and learn more about spiritual media blog and be part of your community? 
So the best part is just to go to spiritualmediablog.com. That's spiritualmediablog.com. My email is there, um, but my email address is editor at spiritualmediablog.com. So that's, that's probably the best way they can get in touch with me. Well, Matt, thank you so much for taking the time to be on the show with us here today. Oh, thank you so much. This is a, a really enjoyable and interesting conversation. Well, thank you, Matt. It has been such an honor to spend this time with you and to talk about your work at Spiritual Media Blog. Make sure to check out all the videos and, of course, the books he recommends. Here's a word from our sponsor who makes today's show possible. Internationally recognized and award-winning author Judy Goodman works and teaches outside the box of limited thinking. Working with people from every walk of life, her goal is to empower you to be the best you can be, no matter what the challenge is. Born with the gift of seeing beyond our normal vision, she has an extraordinary gift of working with every challenge. Teaching beyond conventional wisdom, her work is described as life-changing. Visit JudyGoodman.com. That's JudyGoodman.com. Special thank you to our sponsor, Judy Goodman, for making today's show possible. Please visit her website at judygoodman.com for more information. There you can learn about her work, her book, and also how to make an appointment with her for a life-changing experience. If you'd like information on our past shows and upcoming guests, please visit mariampastana.com. Well, we're at the end of our time today. I would like to thank everyone for tuning in. You've been listening to Moments with Marianne, where we make every moment count. In a single moment, your life can change. Moments with Marianne is a transformative hour that covers an endless array of topics with the best of the best. Her guests are leaders in their fields, ranging from inspirational authors, top industry leaders, and business and spiritual entrepreneurs. Each guest is gifted and a true visionary, a recognized leader in her own work. And while teaching others to develop, refocus, and grow, Marianne will bring the best guest and sometimes a special surprise. Don't miss this. You never know just which moment will change your life forever. Make sure to tune in and visit momentswithmarianne.com for more information. Oh, 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 oh